And if you have a Bible, you can open it to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. We're going to cover a paragraph in the book of Acts this morning. If you're a guest with us, our, our normal practice as a church, our, our typical uh, normal practice is to just pick a book of the Bible as a church and walk through it one section at a time and discover its, its meaning for us, its permanent meaning and its application to us as a church. This, this next couple of months, we're going to do something a little bit different than that. We're going to do a series that we're calling Gospel Community. Gospel Community... And we're going to look at eight different scripture passages and how they apply to that truth, to that topic. Uh, so we are still going to be preaching through sections, but they're not all going to be in the same book. It's still going to be walking through passages of scripture, uh, but just not in order in a particular book. So gospel community, and we're, we're looking forward to this series starting, especially on our second anniversary. It seemed an appropriate time to start a new series in the church and the title, Gospel Community, is really just a descriptive way of describing uh, what the fellowship of the church is. It's a fellowship that's built by the gospel. It's defined by the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. It's called to witness to that gospel. So a gospel community really is what a, a true church is. Ultimately, a church is not really an institution in the human sense of the word. It's an ultimately an organization. It's a, it's a community of people defined by, saved by, and built around the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what we are. That's what we desire to be, a gospel community community. And in the book of Acts, chapter 2, we read about the formation of the first gospel community. So our spiritual ancestry, from a New Testament standpoint, starts right here in the book of Acts. Now, we're going to focus on verse 42, but, but I, I want to drop into what's happening right before that. So I want you to try to picture the scene. Peter, the apostle of Jesus, is standing before a large crowd of people in Jerusalem who had arrived there for the feast. They are wondering what's going on with this group of Christians. And he begins to deliver a sermon. And so for context, I want to drop into the middle of his sermon. Just imagine him up there proclaiming this in front of a large crowd. And then we're going to focus on the results or what took place after this sermon was completed. Let's begin in verse 36 of his sermon. Then we'll look at our section for this morning. This is Peter preaching. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Now, our section this morning. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I came home yesterday 
uh, at the end of my work day, and I found my wife and my three-year-old sitting at the table working on a puzzle. And if you've ever done a puzzle with a three-year-old, you can appreciate the amount of patience that is required. Uh, but they were almost done with this puzzle. It was almost completed. They, they were in solid momentum was being gained. And, and then I was able to sit there with them and sort of help uh, to sort of serve my wife to speed up the process uh, and help them get to the end of the puzzle. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed watching my little son finish the last piece and then realized that the puzzle was done. He sort of gazed around and this smile spread across his face. We've done it. It's all done, every piece in place. And I thought, even at three years old, you can, you can appreciate that joy. Most people, uh, if, if, whatever they feel about puzzles, that's the part they love the most. There's some people, they don't love any other part of puzzles, except the last piece part of puzzles, and some people, they enjoy the process, but everybody seems to enjoy the finished moment of the puzzle, the completed puzzle. All the pieces are in their proper place, and together they're contributing to this picture being fulfilled that's standing upright on my table in a box form. It's done. The puzzle is done. We have completed it. And it seems to me that Talking about the gospel community, the church, is a lot like that. Except that the puzzle pieces are not little jigsawed cardboard. They are people. They're living and breathing. They're Christians. They are a part of something. And without them, the something is not completed. And yet they are not the whole. And if you've ever had that terrible experience of getting to the end of a puzzle and realizing you are missing a piece, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Actually, I found out yesterday, there's websites devoted to restoring missing puzzle pieces. <laughs> uh, somebody has got a, a, an entrepreneurial mind and said, I'm going to make money on that experience. <laughs> and so you can find these websites that they will restore your lost puzzle piece, apparently. And, and I thought, well, isn't, isn't that how it is with the church? A whole greater than the sum of its parts, each part contributing or detracting from the whole if it's missing, and yet no one part being the whole. Isn't that what the gospel community is? And that's really the story of this, this passage in Acts. That's really the story. I, I want to make two points about this passage this morning. One, one is a, a big picture point, and one is going to walk through the details, all right? So if you've heard the expression, uh, don't miss the forest for the trees, or don't miss the, uh, you know, I, I want to not miss the forest or the trees, okay? We want to we not miss the forest or the trees this morning. So the first is a forest point, and the second is a trees point, all right? Two points, rejoice and reflect. Rejoice and reflect. So big picture point first, rejoice. Rejoice in God's plan for the church, in God's plan of a gospel community. Here's, here's the point I want to make. Before we get into the details of this passage, I just want to make a point about the fact of this passage. L let's think about, if we were writing a book, the fact that it could work to simply skip over verse 42 through 47. It could work as, as a as a book, right? I mean, you just read verse 41. So those who received the word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And we would say, yes, that's amazing. 3,000 people. 3,000 people got saved that day. And then you could certainly stop there and jump ahead to chapter 3, verse 1. Now, Peter and John were going up to the temple. Move ahead, different day. Now, guess what happened? Peter and John... God uses Peter to raise up a lame man and he celebrates and even more people respond and mission is moving forward and people are getting saved and God's doing mighty works through his apostles. You could chop out verse 42 and 47 and the story would in many ways make sense, wouldn't it? It would, except that this is the Bible and we don't chop out parts. <laughs> We don't tear out pieces, do we? Actually, we celebrate the parts that are there. We rejoice in them. And more importantly, we cannot understand the Bible without the existence of the church. Very important point. My, my children have a, a little book that talks about owl and toad and their adventures and these kinds of things. Well, one is called Tearwater Tea. Um, it's a 
sort of ridiculous story, but, but basically Al wants to make tear water tea, so he has to make himself cry. So he thinks of sad things, and he thinks of broken chairs that no one can sit on again because their legs are destroyed, and he thinks of spoons that have fallen behind cabinets never to be found again, and he thinks of, of books that can never be read because their pages are torn out. Have you ever read the story? And so then he begins to cry of all the sad things, and he makes tea, and it's gross, and whatever. <laughs> but, but it strikes me that tearing out the church from the Bible is a lot like Al's experience. Without the church, the community of God's people, the, the Bible cannot really be understood and read. It becomes an entirely different book. And that's true in Acts, as it speaks to this passage. It's true later in Acts, because Paul is gathering people and planting churches. It's true if you look about the, nest, the rest of the New Testament, because a lot of the New Testament is written to churches. Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Those are gatherings of people. Those aren't just individual Christians. It's not, oh, brother James, follow the Lord Jesus. Actually, letters written to individuals are, are, are a much smaller number of letters in the New Testament. Most of the letters are written to churches, gatherings of people, or regions of churches even. And even if you go ahead to the book of Revelation, how does it begin? With warnings to seven churches. Seven gatherings. So let's just begin here and make this point. Those saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ are called to the gospel community. If you're saved by the gospel, you're called to the gospel community. That, that, that is the obvious point of reading Acts. If you're saved by the gospel to be drawn to the Lord Jesus, you're called to be included in the gospel community. Now, there's a lot of different ways we could say that. Conversion leads to community. You're called to be included. You're set apart to be a part. Isn't that what Acts is saying to us right here by this paragraph being included? We are not saved to remain alone. We're saved to be included. This is a biblical point. This is the point we have to feel. It's very important that we feel this point. We are not saved to remain only in a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. In coming to Jesus, we come to his building project on earth, which is gatherings of people and ultimately the great gathering of those people in heaven. We're set apart by Christ to be a part of his church. Those saved are devoted to the gospel community. That's what happens in Acts. That's the teaching of the New Testament. You simply cannot read the New Testament without seeing God's purposes for gatherings, gospel community gatherings. We need this teaching. I think, I think we need it uh, for a couple of reasons. We need it because I think in our culture... Uh, religion and many other things it has been radically individualized. Radically individualized. Your faith is between you and God. That's your faith. And that doesn't really bother very many people. As long as you pray to your God and seek him in your home and alone, that's fine. That's great. You do whatever you want at home. But the idea that we're called to belong to a group and that that's part of what it means to follow Jesus is sort of countercultural. It, it's not something that you, you see as a calling. Now, it's certainly a choice you can make if you want to. If you prefer to be with people, that's certainly up to you. But, but the New Testament seems to put it at a higher priority than that. No, 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 you're, you're a puzzle piece. You're supposed to be in a puzzle. You're not meant to be alone. I mean, you could add lonely puzzle pieces to Al's list of sad things. Lonely puzzle pieces that ruin the puzzle they're meant to be in and miss out on their own calling as well because they've fallen behind a dresser, never to be found again. I mean, couldn't that be a tear water tea <laughs> listing? Yeah, similar to a Christian. Because a Christian's called to be a part. He's called to be among. He's called to be with. He's called to support. He's called to complete what God has intended to be together. Conversion leads to community. Saved by Christ results in included in his body. 
crucial point for us to make. And I call this point rejoice in God's community, partially because I think it's easy for us to accept this idea technically, theologically, but to fall short of rejoicing in it. But if it's in this Bible, I don't get the impression in verse 42 through 47, just taking a whole forest look at this, I don't get the impression of drudgery. Or, do you get that impression reading that passage? Burden. Oh, great. I got saved by Jesus, and now comes the people. I, I just don't, I don't feel that here. I mean, it says glad and generous heart to the end, praising God, having favor with all, the all came upon every soul. I don't get the impression it's like, man, I love Jesus, but the church is a real drag. I don't really want to be with people because they're awkward and sinful. And I, I would rather just be, I, thank you for saving me, but I'd rather be, I don't get that impression. I get the, the sense of rejoicing. Rejoicing in the context of God's gathering of... Don't you get that impression here? That's the impression I get. I think that's threaded through here. There's a sense of joy that they've been brought together. They're a, a new people for God. God has established a new people on earth from every tribe and language and nation, and he's gathered them surrounded by the, their, their fellowship and their love for one another and called to this unity of followership of Jesus Christ, that they now have more in common than they ever could have before, that people from every, every tribe have come to Jerusalem, but because they believe in Jesus, regardless of their background, they have more in common than what they don't have in common. And there's a joy in that, I think it says here. Rejoice in God's plan for the church. We're converted to be included. We're saved to be a part. And we're supposed to rejoice in that truth. Now, I, I think it's possible in our individualistic age for the church to be more of a burden than a joy. I, I think that's true for a lot of reasons. I think it's true because we are individualistic. We're distracted by entertainment. We're distracted by this world. We like being individuals. And the idea of being individuals, a part of something, can feel restraining, can feel restrictive. And yet, there it is. There's, there's a joy in the fellowship. I, I think um, that there's also a, a certain disillusionment that can happen with the church. You may know people. This may be some of you. Because you're great to look at the, the Bible, and that picture seems fabulous. But, but then you go and, and you look at the, the reality on earth, and you think, well, this doesn't look very much like that. I mean, have you met the people I know? I mean, in churches? Um, I, gosh, I mean, I, I try to be joyful, but it's hard to be joyful when you're, you're working with this guy. I heard recently about a, um, about a, a painting... It was in the news that it was on display in some museum, and um, and they had apparently. I, I guess what they did is they had they had moved up the stanchions there so that people could see more closely. I think this is what they did, and so some child was there and he tripped and fell into the painting and and tore it uh, at this museum. Well, which is I mean understandable. Kids do that kind of thing. Well, then I found out the painting's worth like one and a half million bucks, <laughs> and I thought. You know, that's a bad day. If you're a curator of a museum, guys, art is for the people. And then you, you, you know, he, he lets them get close enough somehow. And then some kid, what mom trips? And, and, and they're, they're, oh my gosh, you know, the, the head that was there is gone now. And there's a large tear. I, I thought, how do you explain that, you know, to the owner, whoever the owner is? I, you know, it's, it's probably not worth a million and a half anymore. But we, we have scotch tape, so we are going to uh, do our best. And, you know, sometimes I think that the church is like that. You, you come assuming you're going to find this masterpiece, and you're like, oh, my gosh, look at that. It's all torn. It's supposed to be a million bucks. That's not worth a million bucks. It's bandaged. Sometimes it has tape. Do not come too close. Danger. Problems have taken place here. It's kind of raggedy. And we, we can feel that way about the church. We can feel like somebody tripped and fell into this thing that was supposed to be amazing, and now it's all ripped up and torn and everything, and it's not all that beautiful. And the people aren't like they are in the Bible all the time. I, I don't get the fruit of the Spirit. I get the fruit of me a lot. I don't get the fruit of the Spirit 
always in the church, and we can feel fatigue, we can feel disillusioned because leaders fail and people fail and community doesn't work out the way we want it to. We were slandered at one point, or we noticed a, a teacher that proclaimed one thing and lived another, or we noticed a, a fellowship group that was focused on itself rather than welcoming in new people, or we noticed a moment when gossip broke through the church like a fire and, and destroyed previous friendships, or we noticed time where we, we thought we were really close together, and then they, they left and moved, and I don't know why, and this person that I assumed was such a great person, and then they let me down in that serious way, and we used to be close, and now we're not, and I I called her five times and she never called me once. And we begin to experience fatigue with the concept of the church, don't we? A lot of people feel that way. There's a lot of people that are disillusioned with the church. You know what the church on earth is? It's an unfinished puzzle. It's an unfinished puzzle. Same puzzle was on the, on the table yesterday. Another child's working on it, trying to complete it again. He's going to do it himself. Another sibling comes in, messes it all up. Great. All the progress we made. I was just starting to have faith in this again. Now look what you did. That doesn't look anything like that top now. Just all raggedy and there's pieces all over the place. And who knows what's going to happen next. All my effort. That burden of disillusionment and fatigue... I believe needs to receive the invitation of Jesus. And Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I want to encourage you this morning. I want you to take whatever the disillusionment with the church and I'd like to encourage you to take it to the Lord. The masterpiece is in heaven. It is not so vulnerable. God's ultimate purpose for the church can't be fallen into and shredded or jumbled on top of a table. Now, every church is going to be at various stages of completion or incompletion, growing closer or growing farther. But, but ultimately, God will ensure that every true church in the end will be completed and will perfectly reflect his intention. In the end, along the way, we're going to see holes and broken places and places where the edge wasn't finished. And where's that corner? And I don't even understand this section. How could it possibly be these sections are supposed to be filled by these pieces? That's what it's going to be like in the church. How, how could we have too many spaces and not enough pieces? That's what it's going to feel like in the church. It's going to feel like we're not there yet. Of course, we're not there yet. But we can take our burden with that and our worry about that and our personal pain with that and take it to the master and lay it at his feet and say, Lord, I don't know how you're going to finish this, but ultimately that's your job. My job is to be a piece. I, I'm not going to fold my arms and, and walk away and say, those pieces are ridiculous. I am not going next to them. No, I, I don't want to be a grumpy puzzle piece. I want to say, I don't really like this piece next to me. It's hard to be this close. Their edges are rough and disorganized and unloving and uncaring and harsh and unkind. And why God wants me to be next to them, I don't understand. I'd really rather be up there in the corner where the clouds are because that's the nice people in the church. But here I am down at the bottom where the grassy, rocky section of the picture is. And why I have to be here with you, I don't know. Okay, but that's where we are. Let's take our burden of the church to the master and let him place his yoke on us. It is his job to perfect the church. It is our job to love the church. It is his job to perfect the church. And he loves it as well. It is not our job to perfect the church or to only be in a perfect church. It is our job to love the church, to rejoice in his plan to rejoice in his plan for a gospel community. Let me encourage us to do that. I also think this is an important um, passage and section, and I want to encourage us to see this value as we start this series on gospel community. Uh, because of the season we're in as a church, I, I think this is kind of a pastoral reason. If I can give you a pastoral reason why I wanted to do this series. 
Um, when, it, when a church enters their second year, their first year, their second year, their third year, uh, some of the, uh, there, there's a certain test that often comes to the life of that church. If you ever planted a church, you know this to be true. The test is, is a test of fatigue when the newness adrenaline wears off. It's a test of fatigue when the newness adrenaline wears off. There's, there's a certain newness adrenaline at the early season of the church's life when everything's great and everybody's great and you love everybody and serving is easy because it's fun and look what we're getting to do. It's all new and fresh and shiny and clean. And you look at everybody and think, man, we have the greatest collection of Christians, I think, in the world. Our puzzle's almost done. I mean, one year in, we have everything we need. Everybody's loving and kind and gracious and patient and everything I need is being provided for and we serve and we're happy. Well, as as the years roll by, you begin to realize some of that enthusiasm, I think, was kind of an adrenaline fog, a newness fog. Because I'm looking at the same person that I used to think was fabulous, and now they don't seem fabulous. I mean, they seem fine, but not fabulous anymore. And I'm serving in the same way that used to be thrilling, and now it's kind of annoying. And I'm tired, and I don't want to do that again. When that happens, and trust me, if that hasn't already happened to you and you've been a member of this church, it's going to happen to you. It, trust me, it will happen to you. People that used to think were fabulous will just be kind of fine, maybe even annoying. <laughs> Service that you used to love is going to be kind of burdensome. Oh, I forgot to do that again this week. You're going to experience that fatigue. Redemption Hill Church, let me just warn you. If you haven't already, you're going to. You're going to feel When you experience that, let me just plant some equipping in there from Acts chapter 2. Fatigue is normal. It's normal in the life of a church. That's why we need to return to the calling of the Bible so that we can move past the season of adrenaline and newness and into the muscle of enduring faith. Real church isn't built on newness adrenaline. Real church is not built on the adrenaline of newness. It's built on faith fueled by the word of God. Real church is built on faith fueled by the word of God. So if you begin to experience adrenaline fatigue, service weariness, fellowship burden, let's come back to the scriptures and begin to build the muscle of faith faith in what God has called us to do and to be. Faith individually, faith corporately, faith to be the part we're called to be. Uh, frankly, I, I'm kind of glad we're, we're sort of reaching the first phase because I, I want to see us build muscle as a church, the, the muscle of endurance, the muscle of true love that sees people for what they really are like and loves them anyway. The muscle of patience. It's easy to be patient with fantastic people. Harder to be patient with fine people. Really hard to be patient with annoying people. But that's church. That's real life. If they always seem fantastic, you're not really building any muscle yet. You've downed nine or ten Red Bulls of newness, and you're just buzzing along that for a while. What we need to get into is the muscle of true love and sacrifice and service and kindness and faith. That's what we need. If you're not experiencing fatigue and service, you will you will, and you'll need to return to the truth of God's calling. You're called to be a part. You were called out to be made a part. You were called out to be included. You were converted to be in a community. You were saved to be a part of. You're set apart to be a part. You're to be devoted to the gospel community by the gospel that saved you. That's what God has called us to be, and it's a glorious calling. We need to return to it and enjoy it as well. Listen to this by Pastor John Stott. He says this, Now, it is understandable, even inevitable, that we are critical of many of the church's inherited structures and traditions. Every church, in every place, at every time, is in need of reform and renewal. But, but, we need to beware, lest we despise the church of God and are blind to his work in history. We may safely say that God has not abandoned his church, however displeased with it he may be. He is still building and refining it. And if God has not abandoned it, how can we? 
If God has not become so burdened by the church that he can't keep building, how can we? If God is excited about the future of the church, shouldn't we be as well? If God is passionate to see his church built on the earth such that the gates of hell will not prevail against it, then shouldn't we be as well? Yes, we should. Let's rejoice in gospel community. All right, second point, reflect. Rejoice in God's plan for the church and reflect God's plan for the church. Reflect. Let's just walk through. I just want to give you five words. Uh, we're not going to spend these in detail, but five words to kind of categorize some of the marks of the fellowship here that we as a church want to reflect in our church as well. Um, we're, we're not making up around here a new way to do church. Okay, that's not what we're doing. We're never going to do that. But we're not making up a new way to do church. We're not like thinking, okay, what's, what's really going to connect? What, what structure, I mean, for Round Rock is just the Round Rock Church? That, that is not a conversation. We don't sit there thinking, what's, what's a Round Rock Church like? I mean, what, what really is the right? No, we, we go to the Word and say, what are the marks of the church in the New Testament, and how can we reflect those? I would be culturally sensitive, certainly, but not culturally driven. We'll be community aware, but we'll be Bible-based. So we look here, we say, okay, what, okay, Lord, what are the marks that you have given us in these ancestors that we're to reflect as well? Five words, devotion. Devotion. They devoted themselves, and you see a summary of what they devoted themselves to. That word devote, it means to attend with attention, to give attention to, to give the right priority to, to set yourself towards. That's what that word means. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship. That means that they were receiving teaching, uh, teaching that was truth, doctrine, the teaching of God's word, and fellowship. That word koinonia means partnership, connection, connectivity with other people. So this was not merely a teaching center, nor was it merely a social gathering. There was a teaching, edification, growth element, and there was a fellowship, relational, partnership element to what they were doing. See that? They were devoted to this kind of experience. They were devoted to the breaking of bread. That means that they were sitting down and eating together. Again, this is a relational, spiritual, edified community. That's what's taking place here. And prayers. So there's, there's a vertical component, there's an edification component, there's a relational component, there's a hospitality component. That's what's happening. And the main word I want to key in on is that word devoted. They're devoted to these things. We can't stop at rejoicing. We have to reflect. Redemption Hill Church must reflect the New Testament church. It must. It's called to. We're not building a different puzzle. It's not like we're saying, well, I know that's the puzzle, but maybe what else could we make with these pieces? Let's make a different picture. No, this is our box top. Okay, we're building this one. So what do we do? Well, we're devoted to teaching. We're devoted to fellowship and koinonia, a partnership. We're devoted to, to relational get-togethers, meal times, and that sort of thing. We're devoted to prayer, so there's a vertical component. There's a spiritual component. Devotion to all of those things should characterize us. Not occasional interest, not temporary interest, not haphazard interest, devotion. Reflecting the New Testament church means devotion. Quick caveat. That does not mean everybody quits their jobs and moves into Robin Trish's mixer's house and we all camp out and have a fabulous time teaching and praying and fellowship. No, 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 no. Obviously, this is in context of the teaching of God's word in general. But it does mean devotion. It does mean giving a, a large priority to the importance of these things. It doesn't mean neglect. <laughs> Whatever amount of time it does mean, it doesn't mean no time <laughs> or little time. It doesn't mean small priority. It means devotion. Devotion, first and very important word. Second word, power. It says the result of this community experience was that awe, that might be fear, awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Now, unfortunately, we don't have uh, the Apostle Peter or John here in this church, so we, we can't precisely reflect uh, this mark. If we did, that would be marvelous. I would quit and they would preach. Uh, I'd be great. Uh, but we don't. But however, we can reflect this experience in our longing to see God move in power in our church. We can long for that. Even Jesus said, if you believe greater works than these will you do. 
We can long for God to heal people among us. We can long for the lost to be saved. We can long for him to do mighty works in our fellowship and mighty works in our witness and mighty works when we gather together. There's a sense of his presence among us such that awe came upon them all. Awe comes when you're aware this is not merely people getting together. This is people getting together with God. That's when awe comes. They weren't awed by the athletic ability or the intellectual ability. They weren't awed by some kind of unique social structure of the church. They were awed because God was among them. That's why they were awed. And that's what we want to mark as well. We want a church that experiences the power of God. The power of God in preaching and worship and believing that God can do miraculous things among us. That's what we want a church that believes and longs and expects those things to take place in our witness and in our fellowship and in our Sunday gatherings and in our private gatherings and our families and our workplaces that experiences such an evidence of the supernatural working of God that we have to say God is among that people. Power, second word. Third word, love. Love. Just summarizing uh, verse 44 and 45. All who believed were together. Notice the togetherness emphasis in this passage. They're together. They're together a lot. They're eating together. They're believing together. They're, they're, all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now, just a quick clarification. I don't think that God meant to say they were selling all their possessions because he didn't say all their... I don't think this is communism in the Bible, okay? I don't think that's what this is. I think what this is communicating is a heart of generosity that when they see people in need, they love their community so much they would rather part with their things than see people in need, that's the heart being displayed here. It doesn't mean that everybody had exactly the same amount of things. They had all things in common. I think a modern phrase that would get across what's going on here is somebody who says, look, what's mine is yours. That doesn't mean you transfer ownership technically, legally. I think, I think what's being described here is, look, I, I, I am much more concerned about you than my stuff. I, I love you much more than I love my physical comfort. I, I would much rather see you provided for th than keep this article that I have, this furniture that I have, this piece of land that I have. I I'd much rather love you and be with you and see you provided for than have physical comforts on this earth. I mean, that doesn't even compare. I think that's what's being described here. Tommy loses his job. And it's been four months. And Jimmy's in his small group, and Jimmy says, man, I, we don't have any cash in the bank, but we got a big TV. I don't know what we could get for it, but maybe something. I think that's kind of like what's being described here, isn't it? I, you know, I, I do have that, that, that old piece of jewelry. I mean, I, I know. I, I, mean, I don't know what we could get for it, but, but maybe... Or, you know, I have, I have the opportunity to work some extra hours. Maybe I could work some extra hours and I, I, could, I could help them out. I, I, that's what we'll do. Or maybe let's have them over. I mean, we, we'll, we'll just include them in our food budget this month. There's just a, a love. There's a sacrificial love. Oh, the, the Johnsons. Are, man, I, they, they, they are going through a rough time. How, how can we serve them? You guys want to wanna, wanna, wanna borrow our wagon? How can we serve you? We, yeah, but don't you need it? Oh, you know, we can do without it. It's okay. D don't worry about it. We'll, we'll be fine. You, you guys need it more than we do right now. Hey, I, I heard that Sally was sick. Is that right? Oh, yeah, it's really not good news. We don't know what's going to happen. Okay, let, let, us bring you, let, let us bring you a meal. And c Can we take the kids for you? Well, I thought you had, were busy all this week. Oh, we'll figure it out. Don't worry about it. There's a love that characterize this community. That is understandable if you remember the context. Remember how they were saved? The Lord that you crucified. We're going to talk about love again next week. But in light of Jesus dying for our sins, what can I give up to love those 
that he also died for. It's not surprising that the gospel would create a gospel-reflecting community. Love. Fourth word, quickly, partnership. Partnership. I, I struggled to find a word to describe verse 46, but uh, partnership seemed like a good word. Day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. So he goes back to, they're eating together a lot. They're eating together a lot. I, I heard somebody say, um, we tend to think of our homes in this culture as a place of retreat, but in the New Testament, they seem to be a means of ministry. The kitchen table in the New Testament is a means of ministry. It doesn't mean we don't have private times with our families, certainly. But in the New Testament, frequently, the kitchen table is a means of ministry. It's not our castle to retreat behind. It's a place of welcome to benefit others. That seems to be the way the New Testament treats their homes. That's how we should treat our homes as well. There's a partnership, so they're attending the temple together. That's probably because the temple, was, well, they were used to going to the temple partially, but also because it was big enough to accommodate. This is obviously a large group of people. Uh, they don't have stadiums everywhere back then, right? I mean, so 3,000 people, they have got somewhere to go. And so the temple was large. That would have been a, a normal place to meet. They may have received teaching there. Then they go back to their homes. We might think of our small groups or personal hospitality. They're breaking bread together. Then receiving their food. Listen to this combination of words. With glass and generous hearts. Glad and generous. So they're giving and receiving. Notice that? They're glad. They're grateful. They're not demanding. I expect you to love me. You haven't had me over recently. No, no, no. They're, they're, they're glad for what they receive. And generous. They're looking to give. So they receive with gladness and they give with generosity. They receive with gladness. They give with generosity. So this partnership, this we're living life together. We're gathering together. We're doing hospitality together. I'm giving to you, and you're grateful. You're giving to me, and I'm grateful. We're giving generously, and we're praising God together. This is their lifestyle. The lifestyle is one lived together. They do life together. They're not looking for isolation. They're looking for community. It doesn't mean they lose their personhood or their family identity, but they're looking to intertwine themselves with others. That's what's happening here. Breaking bread together, attending the temple together, receiving food with glad and generous hearts. That There's a sort of a lifestyle rhythm that I think we're supposed to pick up in the Jerusalem church and reflect. When we talk about gospel community, we're talking about a community that is in partnership lifestyle together. Last word, welcome. Welcome. They had favor with all the people. That's a result of a lot of these things. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So the Lord keeps adding. People keep getting saved. Probably as people witness in the marketplace or Peter's still preaching in the temple. Somebody comes in to listen and they get saved. And the Lord adds to their number. This is an important mark for the church because it's easy to, to get to a place in fellowship where you've, you've got it all perfect. This corner of the puzzle is magnificent. We all love each other. We got a few ragged edges on the outside, but that's okay. Nobody else needs to link up because that's going to create issues, okay? Spaces and problems. We like our corner, and I don't care about the rest of the puzzle. And God says, well, you're not done yet. You're not done yet. We have more pieces to add. Yes, but I, I don't want to add more people. Well, God says, I'm sorry. I'm adding people. I'm adding people to you, to your life. And so, metaphorically, your puzzle has got to be ready for new pieces. Your table's got to have empty chairs. Your heart has to have empty spaces. Our heart has to have empty spaces. I've got my three best friends. It's perfect. <laughs> hey, look, there's a new family. They're going to join your small group. Put some more coffee on. Welcome. The Lord is adding to their number day by day those who are being saved. There's a lifestyle of just expecting new people, including new people to come, including God to save people. Don't know how many each day that happened. We don't know how many is going to happen in this church. How many? I don't know. But we should be ready for it, excited for it when it happens, ready to include. Ah, we've been meeting together for a year. We can add two more people, sure. We can multiply our small group. It's gotten too big now. That's all right. It's hard. I don't like it. I've been enjoying it. I'm familiar. I'm comfortable. Now we've got to get back to the hard work of building again, but that's okay. Familiarity is like a drug that weakens the church's welcome. 
Let's not get hooked on it. Welcome. Those are marks of the church. That passage is, is rich. You could study that masterpiece forever. Look at that, and the color in the corner. But, but we're not just called to study it. We're called to reflect it. We're called to reflect those principles. We, we look down from studying to reflection. And we say, okay, how, okay wow. Uh, this doesn't look like that yet. That's okay. We're going to keep, keep building. Where does that piece go? I'm not sure. Let's, let's build that in over here. How, how we do? Oh, wow, we got that. That is, we, we don't look um, like that. We, these three, we're doing well. This one, not very welcoming right now. Let, let's get more well. Wow, we, we, we're good on the devotion to teaching. Uh, the breaking bread doesn't seem to be happening very much. Let's, let's see how we can, let's build that in more, right? We're called to be included. We're set apart to be apart. Conversion leads to community. Those saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ are called to build and to be the community of his gospel. And we need to see the privilege of this. That moment in Acts started something that led to this moment right now. I was talking to some friends recently and saying, you know, one of the things I'm, I'm looking forward to in heaven is doing a little personal research and meeting every person that shared the gospel such that it eventually led to me. You know, all, all the way back to right here. So my mom and dad, and then who shared the gospel with them, and then who shared the gospel with them. Just go back through the centuries in heaven, we'll have plenty of time, and just meet all of those people, and hear about their churches, and hear how God built them together, and hear how God created a gospel community. That, that's, that's what I want to see happen. That, that's, that's what I want to see in heaven, is, is to see how God built these gospel communities, and it led to me, it led to us, it led to this church. That's what I want to see. That's what we should want to see. And we should want to see those that come after us, affected by this gospel community. John Stott, again, to close, says this, the church lies at the very center of the eternal purpose of God. It is not a divine afterthought. It is not an accident of history. On the contrary, the church is God's new community for his purpose conceived in a past eternity, being worked out in history and to be perfected in a future eternity is not just to save isolated individuals and so perpetuate our loneliness, but rather to build his church. That is, to call out of the world a people for his own glory. So then, the reason we are committed to the church is that God is so committed. Now, to make very clear, I am not saying this thinking that we are the only true church out there or even in this area. Or that every person sitting here will always never be in this church. No, I'm saying this because there are churches to be built in this area. This is one of them. There are others. You may move somewhere sometime. God may call you elsewhere. We may plant a church at some point in our future. I, there's lots of different places that this can be reflected in meaningful local congregations. But the point is, as Christians, we're converted to be included. We're set apart to be a part. We are called to build a local expression of the great gospel community because God is committed to the building of his church. Now, in the coming weeks, we're going to look at marks of that church gospel community, very specific marks, love and patience and hospitality and forgiveness, servanthood, unity. We're, we're, we're going to look at a number of these different marks because we, we want to reflect this. We want to devote ourselves like they did because 
we've been saved by the same message that saved them. Our sins put Jesus Christ on that tree. He died for our sins. He saved us from wrath. He made us a people for his own possession to declare that our sins have been forgiven, that our guilt is paid for, that we have a future in his presence forever. Ever and now, like those people, we have declared we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, and believing that, we belong to His people. And so, it will bring glory to that gospel ultimately as we consider what it means to be included in the people of God. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this two-year anniversary. We thank you that in our experience these last two years, you have built your church. The gates of hell, undoubtedly hating what we're preaching and proclaiming here, have not prevailed in the building of this gospel community. And we pray, Lord, that we would devote ourselves to the building of your church into the future, that many future anniversaries will prove your faithfulness, the power of your gospel, and that we would reflect your masterpiece, your master plan in our interactions, in our serving one another, in our fellowship, in our encouragement, in our exhortation, in our warnings, in our love. We pray you would do that among us. Make us a church like the church you describe here. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.